Hey everybody, welcome back. Ready for some more Escape Galapagos? So glad you could join us. And some of you sent me some questions and I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer some at the end of today's reading. But don't forget, you can send them in while I'm reading, but also you can tweet them to me at E.L. Prager on Twitter. Um, just a little recap, if you remember, last time we left off, Ezzy Skyler, Luke, her little brother and father, were on Espanola Island, and Ezzy had just had a little snake and hawk incident, was a little freaked out and said she wasn't going on any more excursions in the Galapagos Islands. So let's begin today. We're on chapter seven, nighttime in the Galapagos. That evening, Ezzy caught several people glancing her way and snickering. No one had mentioned the snake incident, but word must have spread around the ship about her unfortunate reptile from the sky encounter. As they didn't think the other passengers would think it was very funny if it had happened to them. She was still set on her plans not to go anywhere near anything slithering with wings, claws, or fins anytime soon. She'd just have to accept her issue with wild animals and that she wasn't as much like her mother as she and her father had hoped. After the briefing for the next day's excursions, they went to dinner. As he sat quietly while her father and Luke did all the talking, they recounted the hike and described all the animals they'd seen. Luke repeatedly peeked over at his sister, looking about ready to burst. Finally, when he clearly couldn't hold it in any longer, he blurted out, you should have seen your face as when that snake fell on you. Luke nearly doubled over laughing. Others in the room turned to see what was so hilarious. As he felt her face get hot, she glared at, her, glared at her brother. It's not funny. No harm done, as her father said. Besides, you did great. When the going gets tough, the tough run up the trail. She gave them a disgusted grunt, got up, and stomped away from the table. We're just getting as her father called out, come back. As he didn't even turn around, she headed up the stairs and outside to the open deck at the ship's stern. If she weren't so angry, she might have cried. But then she looked up. Whoa, the sky was bursting with stars. Back home, as he had seen stars, but nothing like this. It was the twinkling night sky at home on steroids. Next thing she knew, Luke and her father were at her side. We were just kidding, sis, Luke said sweetly. Her father put his arm around her, gave Ezzy a comforting squeeze, and looked upward, following her gaze. Quite the show tonight. Luke also turned to Skyward. Awesome, he pointed to an especially dense band of stars. Is that the Milky Way? I believe it is, his father answered. Without the lights of civilization, here you can see what the night sky really looks like. As he hadn't really thought about how much difference all the lights of cities and towns make up. Soon a bright speck of light shot across the backdrop of shimmering stars. I think I just saw a shooting star. As she stood watching the stars with her father and brother, Ezzy's anger subsided. In her heart, she knew her family didn't mean to hurt her feelings. As he thought about how sometimes when people think they're joking, it can be hurtful. She made a mental note to herself to remember that for the future. When her neck got sore from staring upward, Ezzy glanced over the side of the ship toward the bow. At first, she thought she was seeing things, too many stars on the brain. But then she looked again and pointed. Dad, there's, there's some kind of light out there in the ocean. See, it's red, and I think it's flashing. Where? Right there, she said, pointing again. There are a couple of red lights, I swear, I'm not imagining it. Her father squinted, staring out into the dark. As I think you're right. Just then, Giovanna happened by. It's a perfect night for stargazing. As he pointed at the ocean, Giovanna, what are those red lights out there? The naturalist cupped her hands around her eyes and stared in the direction as he was pointing. Oh, mierda. She didn't speak Spanish, but as he didn't think the naturalist was saying, oh, happy day. Giovanna ran to a phone on a wall nearby. She grabbed it and spoke rapidly in Spanish. After hanging up, she came running back. Do you still see the lights? They peered out into the night's darkness. The ship began to slow. It then started turning in the distance as he could still see a glimpse of red underwater. What is it, her father asked. An illegal fishing net, Giovanna groaned. Fishermen sink the net and use the red lights so they can relocate it at night and haul in their couch. It's a terrible way to fish. The net catches everything that swims into it, including sea turtles, sharks, and even dolphins. Sometimes they run the catch offshore to a waiting ship outside the marine reserve. 
or they'll try to sell it as legally caught in the markets. But thanks to you, she continued, I just reported it to the captain. He's going to come around to get a better fix on the location, and then he'll call the park authorities. What'll they do, as he asked. Giovanna shrugged, well, we're a long way out, and they don't have a lot of boats, but if possible, they'll come and pull out the net. As the ship turned around, Luke tugged on his father's pant leg and pointed to another light in the distance. It was yellow and seemed to be floating above the sea. Giovanna noticed where the boy was pointing. Looks like another ship, probably an anchor for the night. And they watched as the Darwin Voyager made a slow circle around the submerged lights marking the illegal fishing net. The other ship remained stationary. As he figured, it was probably another tourist boat. Then another possibility came to mind. The fishermen who had set the illegal net. Chapter eight, quiet time goes bad. The ship cruised through the night, as he knew because a nightmare woke her up. It was about snakes falling from the sky, but she realized this time it was only a dream as he relaxed. But still, it took a while for her to fall back asleep. At breakfast the next morning, as he informed her father that she still had no intention of going on a hike, snorkel excursion, or whatever creepy creature escapade was planned for that day, he and Luke tried their best to change her mind. Her dad pulled out all the stops with the faulty sayings, suggesting she was stubborn as a cat, making a mountain out of a mice hole, and that she needed to get back on the donkey. Donkey? What does that have to do with it, as he asked? I think he means horse, Luke corrected, smiling. Exactly, her father added. You know, when you fall off something, you need to get back on it to get over it. Not going to happen, she said. Luke and her father continued to try and convince her. Finally, when she'd had enough, as he relented. Okay, okay. How about if I stay on board this morning and go out in the afternoon? Though she seriously doubted that would happen. I don't know, her father replied. I'm not crazy about leaving you on board by yourself. Come on, Dad, as he said, I'm not a little kid anymore. Besides, what could happen? It's not like I can go anywhere, and there's plenty of crew people around. Her father pursed his lips, looking skeptical. As he yawned and stretched her arms wide. Besides, I didn't sleep well. This will give me a chance to rest. I can even read that book about Darwin you gave me. Her father hesitated. Okay, I guess you can stay bored this morning. Besides, as you said, what could happen? A little later, as the rest of the passengers loaded into the Zodiacs with the naturalists, as he stood on the stern watching one deck up, Luke waved as they headed to shore with Jorge in one of the boats. Aiden and his family were there too. He looked up at Ezzie questioningly and then turned to her father. As the Zodiacs headed for the island, Ezzie glanced around. It was empty and quiet on the back deck. It felt like she had the whole ship to herself. As he let out a long sigh, she could finally relax and not worry about doing anything stupid, embarrassing, or uncoordinated. She headed into the lounge. One of the crew members noticed her and came over. Miss, how come you're not on the excursion? Did you miss the boat? Would you like me to see if we can call them back? No, I'm fine. Are you sure? I bet I could arrange for you still to go. No, thanks. I'm okay. My name's Carlos. If you change your mind, just let me know. I'd be happy to help you get off the ship. Are you sure you don't want to go? As he shook her head and walked away thinking, the guy was being kind of pushy. She stopped to look at the big map of the Galapagos on the wall. From behind her came a deep, gravelly, and distinctive voice. Staying on board, senorita? Not this again, she thought. When Ezzie turned to assure whoever it was, she was truly fine with staying on board. She was surprised to see the captain. He recognized her from the first evening on the ship when he welcomed all the guests. He looked exactly like she expected a captain to look older, stocky, with short gray streaked hair and a matching beard. Uh-huh, as he kind of squeaked out. We keep you here, we keep you busy here in the Galapagos, he said. But senorita, are you sure you want to miss out on the trip this morning? I have connections, he winked. You could still go. What is with these people, as he thought? It seemed like everyone wanted her to get off the ship or something. No thanks, I'm fine, just taking a break. See if you're sure, I am. He turned to the map. You know where we are on it? She shook her head, not really. Now beside her, the captain pointed to the largest island on the map. This is Isabella. Some say it looks like a seahorse. He chuckled gruffly. See, maybe a seahorse carrying grande load. As he laughed, he was exactly right. The top half of the island looked like a skinny seahorse, but below that was a big round section of land as if it was hanging from the seahorse's butt. The captain then pointed to a spot on the lower left side of the island. We're a key. 
here on the west southwest side of Isabella. It is very remote. Not many boats come out this way. A few people live on Isabella. There is one village, Puerto Viamini. A key, he pointed to the southeastern tip of the island. Isabella, she is also one of the most active islands. Active, as he said? You mean like in volcanoes and eruptions? See, last, last year, a wolf volcano, a key, here on Isabella, erupted. He pointed to the northern tip of the island, essentially in the middle of the seahorse's head. Mas grande surprise because we expect the next eruption to happen on Fernandina. He pointed to a smaller round island. It was the only island to the west of its spell. The captain continued, we were muy lucky to see the eruption and make a detour. It was espectacular. People on ship got an excellent treat. Eruptions here draw lots of attention. Ships they cruise by to watch and the park sends rangers to the site. Uh, how often do volcanoes erupt here? As he asked, thinking of Luke and her dad out hiking. I mean, what about the people on the islands? No worry, volcanoes, they erupt not so often. See some lava, but nothing too peligroso, dangerous. And, and no one lives where the eruptions happen. But if that last eruption happens someplace unexpected, how do you know what won't happen where someone is? Like my mom used to say, it could be a science surprise. The captain stroked his beard, see, but honestly, Cinderella, no worry about our volcanoes. We'll be lucky if one erupts. Besides, we get alerts about any activity and earthquakes. Earthquakes, as he repeated. She remembered that on their hike yesterday, Luke thought he felt the ground shake. The captain nodded. See, more earthquakes here than volcanoes erupting. Sometimes the earthquakes are related to eruptions. You mean if there's an earthquake, it could mean a volcano is about to erupt? The captain shook his head. Mm, Maybe, but maybe no. As he stared at the man, not sure what to think. Now I must go see my engineer about a ship. He winked again and walked toward the stern, thinking about earthquakes and volcanoes as he headed to her cabin. Maybe Luke really did feel the ground shake yesterday. Did that mean a volcano was about to erupt? As if flying snakes and other dangerous wild animals weren't enough, now she also had to worry about earthquakes and lava spewing volcanoes, jeez. Oh, as he arrived at her cabin and was about to go in, when she heard a commotion down the passageway. She turned to see two of the ship's officers running toward the stern, as he wondered where they were going. With her curiosity aroused and little else to do, she followed. They went through a door marked true only. As he went up the stairs and through the lounge, reaching the railing on the stern deck, just in time to see a zodiac approaching the platform below. First, she thought something must have happened on the island, and it was one of their boats returning. But then she realized it wasn't one of the Darwin Voyager's boats, which were black. This zodiac was gray. She turned to the nearby island. It stretched for miles, and in the distance, she could see a towering cloud-covered peak. They were anchored too far away to see where the hikers, or the ship's zodiacs were. But to her left lay another ship, smaller than the Darwin Voyager. The zodiac had to be from there. Voices drifted up from below, and as he leaned over to see what was going on, the officers she seen moments ago were on the stern platform watching the approaching Zodiac. One was a woman carrying a first aid kit, as he figured she must be the ship's doctor. The approaching Zodiac carried four men. As soon as the boat's bow nudged the black back platform, two of the men hopped up, helped another man who appeared injured out of the Zodiac. At first, as he didn't recognize any of them, but then she realized one of the men assisting the injured guy was Manuel, the naturalist they'd seen on the hike yesterday as he looked closer. The injured guy was the middle-aged man who'd fallen. Maybe he was hurt worse than they thought. A wide bandage wrapped around his knee and it looked like he couldn't put any weight on his leg. As he listened as the ship's doctor addressed the injured man in Spanish, he quickly interrupted her saying, sorry, no habla espanol. Senor, what did you injure your leg? Can you walk on it? I, then as he heard a sharp gasp, what in the quiet, ordered one of the men below, as he couldn't see who it was. Don't move or say another word. Give me your radios. That doesn't sound good, thought Ezzy. There was a long pause in the conversation. She cautiously leaned further over to get a better look at what was going on, but they'd stepped further back and out of view. Now let's go see the captain. And no funny miss, or you and this gentleman here will be taking a little swim with the sharks. That definitely didn't sound good, Ezzy thought. She heard them moving on the platform below toward the stairs. They were headed up to where she was standing. Searching for a place to hide, she spotted another door labeled crew only. 
With no other obvious choice, she ran for it and slipped through. It led to a short, narrow, empty quarter lined with storage cabinets and what looked like refrigerators. She stood silently for a few moments trying to decide what to do. No one had followed her in or come into the quarter. So a few minutes later, driven by curiosity, as he crept back to the door and cracked it open just enough to see through. The first person up the stairs was one of the men from the other ship Zodiac. It was the burly goatee dude from the hike who wore dark shorts and a khaki shirt like the naturalist and had a towel draped over his bulging forearm. The sun glinted off something just poking out from under the towel as he caught a glimpse of what appeared to be dark metal. It looked like the tip of something, maybe a, a gun. She gasped and slapped, slapped her hand over her mouth, afraid they might have heard her as his heart thumped like thunder in her ears. The big goatee guy glanced around and then turned to watch as the others came up the stairs. The doctor was next, helping the injured man. Both appeared scared and confused. Behind them came the naturalist Manuel, and then the other officer from the Darwin Voyager. At their heels was the other man from the other Zodiac. He was the other guy, as he had seen on the hike, the skinny man with the droopy mustache. He wore clothes similar to the big guy and also had a towel draped over one arm, which pointed at the group. The last man stared at the others, stroked his mustache lovingly, and a slow drawl said, okay, nice and easy. No mistakes and no one will get hurt. Are all the passengers off the ship? The Darwin Voyagers turned to the man hesitantly. I believe so. Okay then, keep going. They headed into the lounge and Ezzy slumped to the floor. Her mind was racing a million miles a minute. What's going on? What do they want? Her heart hammered in her chest and sweat trickled down her forehead. She took a couple deep breaths, trying to stay calm and think what to do. Is there 911 in the Galapagos? She kind of doubted it, especially from a ship out in a remote part of the islands. What about the people on shore? Are these goons pirates? Are they going to steal stuff and leave? Or maybe they're going to take the ship and leave the people on the island, including Luke and her dad. As he suddenly wished, she was on an island surrounded by lots and lots of wild animals. She sat for what seemed like a long time trying to come up with a plan, or at least the courage to leave her hiding spot. She jumped when a loud voice boomed over the shipwide intercom. This is the captain speaking. We'll be conducting an emergency drill in the next five minutes. All crew and staff report to deck four for your assignments. With trembling rubbery, rubbery legs, as he stood and peeked out the door, the back deck appeared empty. She slipped through the doorway and made her way to the back railing, but drew back in a hurry. Other ship was pulling up behind the Darwin Voyager, and more men were soon ready to climb out. Things had just gone from bad to worse. Oh, how she missed those booger-sneezing iguanas. Chapter nine, hijacked. As he ran back through the crew-only doorway into the small, empty quarter, quarter, should he find a better hiding spot and wait to see what happened or try and get off the ship? During the emergency drill the first day, Captain explained the ship had life rafts that automatically inflated when tossed overboard. She could throw one overboard and then jump for it. Then what? And if she jumped overboard, what about sharks? Taking a deep breath as he willed herself to calm down and think. Before doing the abandoned ship swim with sharks routine, she decided it's better to figure out what the men wanted after, since they had invaded the ship. If they planned to take it and leave everyone on the island, she wanted to be with her dad and brother, even if she had to go overboard and paddle with great whites. Then again, if they were just there to steal stuff, as he hoped they would leave once they had what they wanted. As quietly as possible, she crept through the crew corridor to a connecting door and peeked through its small round window. It led to the lounge behind the bar. Not seeing anyone, she slipped silently through the doorway and crawled behind the bar cautiously. She rose to look around. The room was quiet and appeared empty. As he was about to sneak out from behind the bar, and she heard footsteps out on the deck coming toward the lounge. She hunkered down and curled into a ball on the corner. Finding a dirty towel, she threw it over her head. It was a ridiculous way to hide, but she didn't have time for anything else. She hoped no one would look behind the bar, or worse, want a cold drink. This way, someone barked, Enrique radioed. They're with the crew and captain up on deck four. The men ran by, and soon it was quiet again, as he knew she needed to move. She wanted to move, but her legs didn't seem to agree. Fear felt her, held her frozen in place. As he remained still, she was trembling, tears threatened. Then she thought of her mother. 
She remembered how fearless her mother was. As he balled her fist in determination, still shaking, she stood up and looked out from behind the bar. It was again silent with no one in sight. She willed herself to be brave like her mom and crept slowly out into the lounge. A sound, <coughs> almost like a cough, startled her. She jumped and turned toward the noise. Sitting on a couch against the wall, where Ezzy couldn't see him before, was the injured guide from the other boat. She patted over and put a finger to her lips, whispering, they don't know I'm here. That's better than me, the man whispered back. They dumped me here. Guess they figured, what can an old guy with a banged up me do? Do you know who they are, she was asked quietly. What they want? I thought you knew them. No, I just met them on the other ship, he replied. I don't know what they want, but I can tell you one thing. They're not here for bird watching. We saw an illegal fishing net last night. Maybe it's theirs. The man shrugged, maybe. My dad and brother on the island, do you think they're gonna take the ship and leave them there? I don't know, he said. But if another ship comes this afternoon to do a hike, they'll find them on the islands and notify the authorities. But the captain said not many boats come out this way. The bigger ones do. That's good, I guess. The door to the deck one level up squeaked as it opened, and gargled, garbled voices filtered down. The man waved as he away. I think they plan to search the ship. You might want to find a good place to hide. As he nodded, but she had no idea where to hide. Going behind the bar again was nearly as bad as standing in plain sight. Definitely not a good option. As he headed back into the quarter that led from the bar to the stern deck, the narrow space offered little in the way of concealment. She cautiously opened the door to the back deck and peeked out. Off to the side, she noticed a big gray plastic garbage can and had a raised square lid with a rectangular hole facing out to throw waste in. It didn't look like the best or most comfortable place to hide, but time wasn't on Ezzy's side. She decided unhappily that her best bet was to go dumpster diving. Ezzy ran to the big gray plastic can and quickly removed its cover. Inside was a bag about half full of garbage. She pushed the bag aside and climbed in behind it. When she reached over, she, then she reached over, grabbed the lid, and wiggled down inside the can. She placed the lid loosely on top. Now squatting with the garbage bag in her lap, as his head was raised up inside the lid, just enough so she could see out its square throwaway hole. The smell inside was horrible and was hot, really hot. As he adjusted her hips, trying to kneel down, and nearly tipped the thing over. The sound of a door slamming echoed across the deck, and two men came into view as he froze. It was the dark, hulky goatee guy and his stringy haired and mustached partner from the other ship. Check all the cabin crew areas and engine room, Mustache Man said while caressing his facial hair as if it was a pet. We'll start loading the gear and take off some of the crew. Got it, replied the burly dude. How long do we have before the people on the island get back? About an hour, so move your big butt. Hey, that's all muscle, pal, he replied, flexing his overly large biceps. Not like your chicken legs and skinny. Just move your pumped up gluteus, said the stringy hair guy, again petting his mustache. As he rolled her eyes at the conversation, but also breathed a tiny sigh of relief. Based on what they'd said, they weren't going to take, take the ship and leave the hikers on the island. She wouldn't have to take a swim with the sharks after all. Ooh, no, she's stuck in the pail. And that is all for today. We're going to leave Ezzy stuck in the garbage pail with the bad guys on their ship. And Luke and her father are still out on the island. Oh my gosh, I don't know what's gonna happen next. But I'm gonna take a little bit of time now to answer some of your questions. So keep sending them in if you have some. But last week, a couple of people asked some great questions. Sam asked, um, was I ever scared by big bugs in the Galapagos like Ezzy? You know what, I've seen those big locusts, those really big ones, and I've had them jumping all around me. But truthfully, they're kind of cool looking. They're not really scary. So no, never been scared by bugs. Lauren wants to know why are the blue-footed boobies feet blue? That's a great question, Lauren. They're the, the blue feet, the boobies feet are blue because the brighter the blue, it shows that the healthier they are. So the males will lift up their blue feet and if they're really blue, it will attract females because they're big good mates. And they get that color because it's kind of like blue in the sky the structure of their feet scatters light, and so they look blue, just how the sky looks blue. Jess wants to know what time of year do the albatross do their incredible courtship dance. Oh, it's one of my favorites. Very hard to leave when they do it. Well, the albatross are in the Galapagos from about 
December to May, and the best time to see their courtship dance is when they first start arriving. So May, January, February is really the best time. It's really cool. And Maddie wants to know, have I ever, have I ever seen an iguana fly? Remember in the last, in the last reading, we had a big blowhole and one of the iguanas got thrown up. I personally have not seen that happen, but I know some of the uh, naturalists that I work with on Galapagos, they've actually seen that happen. So a lot of what's in the book is based on real things that happen in the Galapagos. And in one of those is, it seems sort of funny, is that Galapagos fly. So if, don't forget, if you have any questions, you can send them to me during our Facebook readings, or you can tweet them to me at Eel Prague, or you can find me on Facebook. So thanks so much. Look, we're going to have some more really cool creatures coming up with the next reading. The live reading will be Wednesday, 2 p.m., same place, same time, same website, and they'll also be all be recorded. So if you don't see them live, you can go onto the Florida Aquarium website page, go to videos, and you can see all the episodes. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you next time.